Chavrim. Welcome to Dunoon Institute of Biblical Research and Middle Eastern Studies. I am your host, Stephen Ben Dunoon. Tonight, we're going to take a, a little bit different approach before we get into Rosh Hashanah. We'll be talking a little bit about that more uh, actually on the eve of Rosh Hashanah. But I want to still take you more into the two-state solution. The news is really captivating the headlines around the world. And, and the troubles that we're seeing for Israel is just on every hand. And I, on Sunday, I did take you into that a little bit and shared with you uh, the, 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 the uh, is, is, let me let me just say like this. We'll go back to Rebecca uh, in Genesis chapter 25, using a King James version of the Christian Bible. Here it reads in verse 23, and the Lord said unto her, uh, Two nations are in thy womb." Because remember, Rebecca was uh, she was kind of troubled because there was the, the there was a like a, a fight going on inside of her womb, and um, and so she goes before the Lord and she asks him that very question. Rebecca says. Uh, She's conceived, she, the children are struggling, and the Lord, uh, she asked the Lord, why am I thus? Or in other words, why is this happening to me? And God says to her, that's because two nations uh, are in thy womb, and two manners of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And as I explain to you what that is, and especially for those that might be tuning in this evening, it was prophetic speaking of the two-state solution that the United States is engaged in with John Kerry as negotiating negotiating that, uh, something as I've mentioned to you, I believe is a Vatican agenda. And we're going to get into that uh, here in the, in, in the coming uh, days and weeks. I'll get more into that so you understand why I call this a Vatican agenda. I want to take you through uh, Shimon Perez and, and what started back in 1993. But we are now at a place, a critical place in life that is happening, uh, and, I, and I feel extremely urgent to, to uh, not only to warn the world and even in our, in our government what the United States is getting involved in, not knowing that the judgment that this is going to bring upon us uh, for, for dividing the land of Israel. Uh, so anyway, but God says here though, and I believe this is why John Kerry chose this nine months there, he may have not have known it, but I believe that God was prophetically looking at His Word, and at, when the time came right, they would set a nine-month negotiations because it was going to throw Israel into a travail, into a tremendous birth pains. Um, so let me just take you real uh, quickly here. Something I wanted to, to bring to your attention as well is the, the nine-month negotiations, the best I can tell, began around July 24th. We're not really sure exactly when they started, at least to my knowledge, uh, not knowing for sure. But nine months from now, that would put it in, uh, I believe I've got it written down here, um, March 24th. Well, the funny thing is, what we're going to talk about tonight is Esther. And that may sound a little strange to you, talking about Esther with, a, with such a serious situation going on in Israel. But I want you to see, because Esther is a type of the bride of Mashiach, the bride of the Messiah. The Christians call that the bride of Christ. Uh, Jewish people, we prefer to say bride of Mashiach. That's something, as I mentioned to you, that uh, Sid Roth even commented on. We should use that terminology because the Jews have been so persecuted as Christ killers. So we, we, have, we, we prefer to use the Hebrew term, which is Mashiach, means the exact same thing. But anyway, um, so we see this here, and then God goes on to say to, to Rebekah, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. And as it says, they'll be separated from the womb. And I believe that when this nine-month negotiation is finished, there will be two states. And the pressure that has been put on Israel for this to happen 
is unbelievable pressure. I mean, you just could not imagine. Uh, Bill Clinton, when he was over in Israel, said to Israel that if they didn't come up with a two-state, a Palestinian state, there would be no state of Israel. I mean, what an assertion for that man to make. And God knows, I have no idea if he realizes how serious of a consequence that brings because being a former president of the United States, he represents our nation as well as a former president. And, and, and let me just say this too. Um, when I speak in regards to uh, Barack Obama, the president of the United States, Barack Obama is a figurehead of this country. And a lot of people, they want to throw the stones at Barack Obama, but you know what really and truly it, th this is? This represents the spirit of our nation. This represents what the what the the people have become to in this nation. I mean, he was elected by popular vote. And I mean, that's why this country is set up. Now, I'm sure there's people who would argue differ on that, but nonetheless, he is in the office. He represents the spirit of this nation. And the spirit of this nation is turned against Israel. And with that comes a consequence in the sight of Almighty God. And so it's important that we recognize what's going on and that as Christian people, you recognize the side that you should be standing on. Uh, so let's, let's take a look at another thing here. I want to take you, uh, of course, I mentioned to you Micah in the book of Micah. I don't have that one up right now before me, but uh, in the book of Micah, um, I uh, wanted to get to Isaiah here real quick to want to bring that back out. Uh, let, me, let me just real quick take you over to the book of Micah there. It, there's a very important uh, passage in Micah chapter 4 verse 10. And we talked about this a little bit the other night, but I wanted to kind of recap this a little bit because we had a little different message uh, about Malachi and leaving them neither root nor branch last night. So I wanted to kind of bring you back to this little thought here. Um, and this is in Micah chapter 4. This is where this all began for me. Um, and, 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 and I, I forget if I mentioned to this to you Sunday night or not, but I, I just saw this, and I think I did, where he says, Now why dost thou cry out aloud? Um, uh, and, and, oh gosh, i got to back up. Look at this a little bit more with you guys here. Okay, yo. Is there no king in thee? Is thy counselor perished? And remember, the whole reason why God asked Israel here, is there no king in thee? He is prophetically looking forward. And, and, and the reason he asked this is because where did Israel make their vital mistake in, in, their, in our history as Jewish people? We made it when we rejected Samuel the prophet and we wanted a king to rule over us to lead us into battle. That's what we said. We want a king like the other nations to lead us into battle. That's recorded in the book of Samuel. You know, God give us a king, he give us a good David, he give us a Solomon. But finally we got an Ahab on the throne. And now we find that Mike Evans, he anoints Benjamin Netanyahu back when Benjamin was a young man, anoints him with that oil, he comes out. And when he sees him, he goes to the Netanyahu's when Jonathan, Benjamin's brother, had died. And he goes there to comfort the family, not knowing the family. Anoints him with oil and says, Thus saith the Lord, you'll be prime minister over Israel, not once, but twice. And by the way, for those of you that don't know, be in prayer for Mike Evans. I just got word he had called the other day to a, a friend of mine, Sister Annette Bridges, uh, who's a prophetess, uh, and, uh, and, and, and he asked her, be in prayer for me. I'm going to Israel. I have my gas mask. We are in a tremendous time that we're living in. And I'll tell you something. When he anointed that man and prophesied over him, and now we see that it's come to pass, what people may not understand, and I don't even know if Mike understands this, Benjamin is playing both parts of King David and King Solomon. Because when he was elected the prime minister in Israel the first time, I remember telling an Israeli lady, it'll never work. Although he's a good man and a godly man and he loves Hashem, it'll never work though. Why? Because God has got to show us that we will fail in the way that, that our way is not God's way. God's way is for us to believe in Him, to cry out for Eliyahu, which in Hebrew that means Elijah. Because why? Now I know Christians, we look at the scripture and we see when the, when the Bible says that Elijah would first come. 
And of course, you know, and, and I believe it's in Malachi chapter 3 that he would prepare the way before the Lord. And we know that John the Baptist was that Elijah. He was the Eliyahu. But they asked Yeshua, Jesus himself, they asked him the question, doesn't the scripture say Elias must first come and restore all things? Or excuse me, they just asked him, doesn't say Elias must first come? And, and Yeshua answers them back. Jesus says, truly he shall first come and restore all things. Well, my friend, what is the restoration of all things? Part of that restoration is Israel as a nation that is forgiven of her sins and her iniquities according to Daniel the prophet in chapter 9. When it says her iniquities will be wiped out. And I mean, you, you know the, the story there. I don't want to have time right now to jump back to that particular passage. But let me just say to you, you know, I mean, that is part of the restoration. Israel back as a nation filled with the Holy Ghost. But remember, it's a remnant. It is a remnant that believes. It's not everyone that is in Israel is going to receive or believe this. So, but anyway, in Micah, you know, God is asking that question. Where, where is there, is there no king in thee? He's reminding of us of our first sin. The way we left God is the way we have to go back to God. We rejected Samuel. God had used me. And you know, the funny thing is, we'll even go further back than that because the time has to come again where God Himself leads as He did by the pillar of fire, which was the Word, the Logos in the beginning, which Yeshua was Word in flesh. The Logos in flesh. We haven't got to that point yet because you have to remember when God was with Moses out in the, in the wilderness and God wanted to come down. He wanted to fellowship with His people. But what happened? Israel said, they said to, to, to God uh, or to Moses, let God speak and not you. I mean, let, excuse me, let Moses speak and not God lest we die. So then God had to lead by a prophet. And then Samuel came and we finally we had so many prophets down through the ages there and then finally Israel didn't want anything to do with the prophet. Now we wanted a king. We wanted to be like the rest of the world. Well, we're like the rest of the world now. And the thing is, is we find that the king won't work. We need to cry out for Eliyahu. And then God will send him even as Yeshua Jesus himself has prophesied about this being. Now I know that there in the two witnesses there's a lot of belief of who those are. We'll go into that on a separate teaching on that. I won't get into that tonight. Let's, let's take real quick. I want to take you because I want to get you into Esther here. So, But anyway, and, and go into verse 10 here in Micah. But in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in travail. For now shalt thou go forth and out of the city and thou shalt dwell in the field and thou shalt go even into Babylon. There shalt thou dwell be delivered. There the Lord God, excuse me, shall redeem thee from the hand of the enemies. Now also many nations are gathered against thee, which is exactly what's happening. Russia's against Israel, Syria's against Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, uh, Iraq, Iran, everybody. Egypt, you name it. The Muslim Brotherhood, the Arab Spring, the whole world turned against Israel again. Europe is against Israel. They, they come out, the EU uh, put sanctions against anybody that's in pre-1967 borders. And now the Christian world is trying to turn against Israel as well. Now I know there's a lot of godly believing Christians that don't. But let me tell you something. Replacement theology is of the devil. And I say that and I say it with sincerity to you. When the Bible says they, are the, they that say they're Jews and are not, and they're the synagogue of Satan, that's your replacement theologist. And Jehovah's Witnesses are chief among them all. Right along with the Vatican and their doctrine that's been replacement theologists for all these years. So, and, and you're finding it more and more. And good godly, seem to be good godly Christians that have always stood by Israel. Now they're starting to turn against Israel. I mean, what's, you, this is why we got to get into Esther tonight so you know how to stand for Israel. In the hours that we're in right now, you need to know how to stand for God's chosen people. And I know there may be some that listen to this program tonight that say chosen. How could they be chosen? Look at the way they are. I mean, the, the Orthodox Jews of Israel, they spit on the Christians. They hate them and everything else. Let me remind you in Zechariah, when they look upon him whom they pierce, they separate each one to his own family. The house of David apart, the house of Nathan apart. And he names all family names, showing that it was never fulfilled yet because that is not tribal order, but only because we know each other by our family name. And they mourn and they weep and they separate the men from the women. Orthodox tradition. See? Don't hate them. 
They were blinded for your sake so that the gospel could be brought to all nations so that the word of Abraham, God's word to Abraham could be fulfilled that you are father of many nations. So they paid a price, a price that is unimaginable. They sowed the, 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 the wind, burying the spirit. And now we had to reap a whirlwind for 2,000 years. So a tremendous price that we paid for this. Um, but anyway, it says that the nations are gathered against her and they say, let her be defiled and let her eye look upon Zion. Why? They want Jerusalem. That's what Zion is, is Jerusalem. Everybody does. They want to cut it in half, just rip it up. And you know, the thing is, here's what's going to be funny. Shimon Perez says to, to Pope Francis, you're the only guy that can bring peace to the Middle East. And when they finally go to build the third temple, which they're almost to the point of doing, remember what the scripture says in Revelation, the outer court is given unto the Gentiles. It's not going to be by force. A lot of misery, no doubt, as we see by the travail, but it's going to be given to them. They will allow Israel to build the third temple next to the Dome of the Rock, which is not of God. And I know there's many people that are looking for the third temple. And yes, believe me, the Vatican will play that up for you like never before. The United Nations President, Barack Obama, John Kerry, all of them, they'll be playing it up. Doesn't the scripture say that Jerusalem is to be a city where all nations come in together to worship? God didn't intend it to be before the millennium, though. Anyway. So they're all after that city. But then it says in verse 12, I love this, but they know not the thoughts of the Lord. Hashem, neither understand they his counsel, for he shall gather them as the sheaves under the floor. And this is where he tells Israel to fight. A uh, good friend of mine, Brother Gary, he called me this afternoon right before going on to, to record the, the broadcast here. And this brother has all kinds of dreams and many of them, I've watched them as time has gone on, as they come to pass. And he told me, he said, you know, Brother Steve, he said, I believe if I understand this one of these dreams right, I believe that it'll be Israel themselves that will actually use a nuclear device against Syria. And that, as he said that, I said, brother, if that happens, that'll bring Russia, that'll bring Iran coming down into Israel, that'll bring Gog and Magog battle on. Yes, sir, you want to talk about a showdown then? My gosh, I guarantee you there'll be a showdown because they'll actually, according to the Bible, they actually get into Israel. How many Jews will die in a battle such as that? And God says in there, let, let, let's look at this real quick. I want to take you real quick to Isaiah before we get to Esther. And I, uh, I know we're getting close to our time here, but I, I, it's important you see these things. Okay. Back up just a little bit here. Now watch here. Verse 7. Isaiah 66 verse 7. Before she travailed, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she was delivered of a man child. Now notice, that's Yeshua. The birth of Jesus. Isn't it interesting how God, He so clearly lays it out in His Word. Before she travailed. Before Israel ever dealt with the nine months of travailing, she'd bring forth a man child. And then the next chapter, or next verse, verse 8. 2,000 years later come to pass. That's amazing. And don't think that it can't happen that way. I hear so many people, they'll tell me, they'll say, well, you know, brother, he said, you know, you, you, you look at the word there and, and, and you read that verse there, but you didn't read the next verse or you didn't read the verse after that or you didn't read down the rest of the chapter. What are you going to do with Jesus then? When Yeshua himself says, he picks up the scroll in the temple, he reads from Isaiah 61, Yeshayahu, he picks that up, and he reads verse 1. The anointing is upon me to preach the acceptable year. He gets into verse 2, goes halfway through the verse. The acceptable year. And he puts down the scroll and he says, This day, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Or in your ears. I forget exactly that particular translation there. Half a verse? What about the other half, Jesus? is to be fulfilled 
nearly 2,000 or more than 2,000 years after he quoted the first half of the verse. So yes, that can be so. Now watch this, verse 8. Who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such things? So shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? Now, that wasn't speaking of 1948. Shall a nation be born at once? That is the new birth. That is the very words that God said to Nicodemus. When Yeshua was speaking to Nicodemus, and he said, except a man be born again, he can no wise see the kingdom of God. That is a prophetic word. And in this case here, back then Jesus, when he was speaking of it, he was also speaking of being born again as an individual. And many Jews did get born again. Many of them received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But the thing was, is he was also speaking of a future of his where he brings forth a nation in one day. And that is in Zechariah chapter 12 when they recognize Mashiach to be the bride. But before that can come forth, before she can be born again, she's got to go through a travailing and I'm going to prove that to you here in just a second, by God's grace. Also, he says, shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Mm. As soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. Shall I bring to the birth and not cause to, to bring forth? You know what I mean? Does God is saying, in other words, should I bring them to this place where I can finally have the children born, have them born again, and then not finish the course? That's what he's saying. Saith the Lord, shall I cause to bring forth and shut the womb, saith thy God? Rejoice ye with Jerusalem and be glad with her, all ye that love her. Rejoice for her, excuse me, rejoice, uh, rejoice for joy with her, all you that mourn for her. Why are the people mourning? Because we see what's happening in the kernel of our minds. Israel surrounded. And when we're going to really begin to mourn is when this battle begins to take place and the troops are in Israel and it'll seem as if God has turned his back on his beloved. And of course, that's when the showdown comes, like it was back when Moses said with, with Korah and Dathan, whoever's on God's side, come stand over here. And then the, the replacement theologist went with Korah and Dathan and God opened up the earth. So which side do you stand on? My God, you better wake up, church. You better wake up. And I know that there, there's, to me there's a difference between the bride of Mashiach and the church. The church has become cold and informal and lukewarm. And God has, has nothing to do with something like that. Let me tell you something. You wait till Israel gets a hold of this. You wait till Israel as a nation gets a hold of this gospel of Yeshua HaMashiach. We'll burn it up in one night. So anyway. Now. I'm going to have to. Wow. I so bad want to get into Esther with you. Let, let, let me, we're going to take Esther because you need to know, you've got to know these things. By God's grace, you've got to know this. In the book of Esther, and I, I'm, I'm really, many of you guys, we know, we know the story. We know that Esther was the daughter of Mordecai. And I, I'm, I'm taking you in this route right here for the sake of time. But Esther was the adopted daughter of Mordecai. Her family had passed away and, and Mordecai, uh, her cousin, had adopted her. And even in the Christian world, many, many theologians know and have taught that Esther is a type of the bride of Mashiach, and, is, and, and, and in fact she is. And um, I have often said that Vashti is a type of Israel. And there, there's those that say, no, they can't be, because how could Vashti be a type of Israel when King um, Asaras, and, and I'm trying to say it the way they do it in the Greek, I don't have the Hebrew right before, before me, uh, Asaras, uh, the king at that time, many people believe, many theologians believe that uh, it was actually Artaxerxes. In fact, uh, Josephus, the famous historian, um, mentions that, that Asaras of the book of Esther is Artaxerxes. 
uh, which I find very interesting in itself because then you find that in the book of Nehemiah. And I remember one time when I was, uh, I just finished an interview with Chuck Missler. We were walking down his hallway there in uh, Coeur d'Alene and I mentioned to him, I said, isn't it interesting, Chuck, about Nehemiah? I said, you know, there's a beautiful picture of the rapture of the church there. And, and, and he says to me, where do you find that? And I said, Chuck, I said, you remember when it says in there in Nehemiah that the queen was sitting at his side? And of course, Nehemiah was troubled uh, at Israel and the turmoil that was going on there. And I said, why does the scripture take the time to say the queen was sitting at his side? Chuck said, Steve, you have to say no more. I know exactly where you're going. He said, I never thought about that before. So I, I can certainly believe that to be so. But let me just let me just let me take you through this here because I know we don't have time to go through here and actually read this. So I want to share with you um, some things here on this. And just so you have a, a, an idea there, I, I apologize. I keep checking the time there because I know we're running short here on time. Um, when the king had come in, and at the time of the year that he would actually have a party, and um, I apologize. You know, I, I realize we're not going to be able to get into this about Esther. Oh my gosh. Uh, this is incredible though. But, but anyway, um, wow, blessed be the Lord. You know, we are just, I have to cut in splices, I guess. I don't know. Okay, yeah, because I've actually ran out of time. Well, I realize that we have run out of time. And uh, I, I wanted to get you into Esther because you need to see where to stand with Israel. And I'll tell you what, tomorrow night, we're going to pick up and I'm going to take you right into Esther. I, I won't backtrack again on you like this here. I'm going to take you into Esther. I know that it'll be a Rosh Hashanah service and that's important uh, that, that we understand what Rosh Hashanah, what it means. It's, it's the Jewish New Year, the celebration of that. But I find even at the beginning of Rosh Hashanah, the most important thing that we could get into is the bride of Moshiach, your place as the true Christian, the wise virgin with oil in your lamp, you need to know how to stand for Israel. And I want to take you through that. So anyway, join us tomorrow night, same time, 6 p.m. Eastern time. Tell your friends about the, 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 the channel here. We're a new channel. Uh, YouTube, you can find us under Ben Dinoon on YouTube. It's at the end in the credits here. Uh, also, our website, IsraelReturns.com. Uh, and if you look to want to support returning Jews to their homeland, go to my good friend Michael Froon's website, IsraelReturns.org. Uh, just almost the exact same website, only differences are ending in there. And uh, he, he, he has got a passion for returning the lost Jews back home to Israel, especially the lost tribes. God bless you, and good night. Thank you for watching this broadcast. If you would like to be a part of this ministry, you can send your tax-free gift to Danoon Institute at 12537 Gemstone Crescent, Fort Myers, Florida 33913 or you can give securely online at www.israelreturns.com For more resources, visit our website again at www.israelreturns.com Also, please visit our YouTube channel, Ben Danoon. We would like to thank some of our valued friends for making this broadcast possible. Thank you for being with us. We trust that tonight's program has been a blessing.